Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In the previous lecture, we discussed about SPR technology, especially Bayakur platform to perform surface plasma resonance based experiment. Dr. Uma Sinadatta, an application scientist and a trainer from G Healthcare gave you the basic idea for doing these experiments. Today she is going to continue where it was stopped in the last lecture and she is also going to provide you a hands on session on Bayakur technology. So, let us have Dr. Uma Sinadatta for today's lecture. So, um, I pointed out one thing uh, to you when you are directly immobilizing your ligand, uh, it is covalently linked right and once you immobilize it, it is uh, immobilized for you good. You cannot use the chip to immobilize anything else right, you, you use the same ligand to do your experiments in that. But there is a smart way to actually um, save your um, or use your uh, chips more judiciously uh, you know. So, when you are actually immobilizing it and you are playing with the RUs how much to uh, you know immobilize and you do not know how much you would like to immobilize or you are attending some part of it. Say we decided to immobilize 600 RUs, but how would you go and immobilize if you then you have to actually look at your contact time, how do you attend that 600 RUs right. So, there is a wizard that we have which we call it as this um, control wizard and when you set up your immobilization you can say aim for immobilization ok rather than putting a contact time for immobilization. And when you do so, what happens is uh, your system actually pulses small volumes um, say around a microliter or so on the surface and does a pre concentration for you. And with the rise in the RU it calculates whatever you have aimed to attend around 600 RUs, it will calculate and let you know in, 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 in the first 6 or 5 to 6 pulses it will let you know whether it is attainable or not. If it thinks that it is going to attend then it proceeds to the EDC NHS step before that it does a quick NRH wash, wash to remove all the electrostatically uh, bound uh, you know ligands and then you do an EDC NHS and then you pulse your ligand based on the information that you had collected and then finally, you do the ethanolamine step. In case you know it, it decides that the concentration that you have supplied is not enough to attend your 600 or use whether it is more or high, it is going to abort your cycle post here. So, your chip is actually intact in this case ok. And this is a very useful tool to use when we are uh, because the chips come really uh, expensive. There is another one which is not added here which is the CM7 typically used for the uh, small molecules ok. A little bit uh, more detail on the chips. The, so, you, you know the basic uh, structure of the chip, the chips are actually on the glass surface on which there is a gold coating, then there is a linker molecule where the dextran molecules are stuck to it and the dextran molecules have carboxymethyl groups and in these carboxymethyl groups is where your covalent linking happens ok. <coughs> the CM5 chip is, is actually our most vers versatile chip, you know any most of your you know even now when I do my first experiment in beer core with a particular system, I would straight away go with CM5. If it does not work, I then go and choose a different um, chip because it is it is been proved to be very very versatile to work for most proteins ok. And it can support almost all kinds of uh, you know uh, covalent chemistry there. Now, a slight variation of the CM5 is actually CM3 and CM4 ok. So, th they are exactly the same, uh, it is just that uh, you know the uh, length in one case the length of the carboxy dextron is the same as CM5, but the uh, 
the carboxymethylation, the, intent, the number of carboxymethyl degree of carboxylation out here is less than CM, uh, in CM5. Whereas, in CM3, the degree of carboxylation is the same, but the length of the dextran is actually smaller. Okay. So, this is used uh, mostly to you know if you want to have work in a low R max region you know if you have a CM5 sometimes you know you do, it's sometimes difficult to attend a low R max whereas in this case it's much easier uh, to attend the low R max. Uh, the smaller size of dextran here um, helps to um, you know do your assays in larger molecules like for example you're working with viruses or cells where the size of the cell is quite big and you know uh, it moves away from the surface. So, the surface plasmon resonance will happen quite far away from the surface and where your uh, the SPR phenomena reduces as you go far away from the surface. So, that is where you actually use a smaller branch so that you can keep your proteins or your cells closer to your surface. C 1 I think we discussed about that which is um, the dextran is all gone, it is only the carboxymethyl groups which are stuck from the surface. In cases where your dextran is causing non specificity, you can use this kind of chip. Okay. Uh, this is your streptavidin, uh, this is a streptavidin chip for your biotinylated protein, uh, but remember uh, this protein, um, the streptavidin biotin binding is extremely high KD, I think it is in the range of. Uh, 10 to the power minus 12 or so, which is actually very, very close to being a, a covalent linkage. So, once a streptavidin and biotin links, you can never, you know, uh, open it up. So, you have to be a little careful when you are using this chip, because once bound, it is good to go, like a covalent chemistry. NTA, uh, this is for the histidine tag. This is reusable, you can recharge your chip all the time uh, with the regular uh, you know, uh, chemicals that are available for NTA columns. Uh, HPA, this is for hydrophobic interactions. Uh, you can uh, coat your hydrophobic, pro, uh, you know, proteins on here. It is a flat hydrophobic thing. Uh, this is to uh, make, a, in this case, you can only make a monolayer of uh, uh, hydrophobic layer, whereas here you can make a lipid bilayer for using the liposomes. Uh, if you have the uh, liposome, uh, mixture you can uh, make a lipid bly layer kind of a structure on this thing and then have the protein studies done on them. Right. So, um, that is the summary of all the chips. I am not going to go through this uh, anymore because we have talked about the various kinds of chips now. Unless you have any questions, I can answer them. Uh, so, that was all about the surface preparation. You know, what which one should you use? What is your ligand? Uh, you know, uh, the PIs that is related important, you know, how, how you can uh, optimally use your uh, chips by not wasting them, right. And we also learnt about the R max uh, in which, which R max you are going to work, things like that. So, the next one is uh, sample injection. This is uh, rather a simple thing, it is just that you know, uh, you are passing your analyte over the ligand that you have prepared. Now, if you remember we talked about that uh, SPR is actually a refractive index uh, measure, right. The change in mass causes a refractive index change which you are um, reading. And so, difference in concentration in your buffer would also actually uh, change your response unit that you are reading, right. So, what we call it is, is actually a bulk effect, you know, the, the when you are passing your analyte, your analyte is in a particular buffer. The buffer also gives you some response unit, okay. So, if you look at this graph, um, your the blue one is just the buffer running without anything, okay. So, it has a teeny bit of response unit. Uh, the red one is actually your, you know, binding as well as your bulk, you know. So, the you are looking at a response unit. Uh, which you have received after binding as well as you are looking at the bulk. If you subtract these two, you actually get your true binding. So, all SPR um, experiments should have a zero concentration which is subtracted and the buffer needs to be exactly the same. So, whatever is the running buffer or the zero buffer has to be used to make the sample, right. 
and then you use a reference surface. This is to uh, remove non-specificity of your analyte uh, with the surface, right? When you're passing your analyte over the ligand, somebody asked me, I think, from within you, uh, that how do you make sure that it is binding to the ligand and not to the surface, right? So you have another blank surface which is just before uh, before your um, uh, active surface and there you actually see uh, if there is any non-specific binding that is happening with your uh, dextran and you subtract that which we call it as a, a reference uh, surface. So when your analyte passes to the reference surface you see a certain pattern of uh, response unit. This is your active surface and when you subtract your this is actually your uh, you know the real binding minus the non-specific binding. In some cases if you have too much non-specificity uh, it might interfere with your binding. In those cases you are <coughs> supposed to use other additives like detergents or there is something called an NSB reducer which is nothing but uh, free carboxymethyl groups which are mixed with your analyte to you know reduce the non-specificity. Okay. There are uh, three different ways to uh, produce uh, or make uh, your reference surface. There are various ways you can uh, have a reference surface. The first one is unmodified. You don't have to do anything. Okay. In most cases that works, but if you are not happy with that un unmodified, you can also treat it exactly how you immobilize. So you activate and deactivate without passing the uh, ligand. So you are treating the surface exactly the same way that you have treated your active surface. Okay. So the first one is unmodified, the other one is activated and deactivated. And the third variety can be you can have a dummy ligand, a knockout ligand which is knocked out of binding that is also possible. Okay. So if you have it, if you have the luxury to have that, you can also have that another way of doing the surface. Uh, certain some sample considerations not uh, I mean very I mean they are very critical but also very logical I mean uh, you know the sample has to be homogeneous you cannot have particulate matter or you know they will create spikes, dirty sensorograms um, eventually uh, difficult to evaluate right. Uh, the quantity of analyte also has to be extremely uh, you know it is very important particularly in certain applications like kinetics, uh, the concentration needs to be determined very accurately. Wrong concentrations will land up giving you, you know, uh, different values. Okay. You need to make sure your analytes are active, uh, they are free of aggregates. If it is aggregated then you get higher response than usual which is not right. Okay. And uh, buffers, that is again what buffers to use, you know that is also very, very important because sometimes you know your interactants may require certain metals, you know for binding to happen. That is something that you need to find out from literatures whether you want to add some additives to you know promote your binding. Uh, so these are some things that need to be uh, considered and also injection time, we spoke about um, how much of time does it take to run a full cycle, right? And it is a very generalized question because it depends on your association and the dissociation uh, that we understood, right? So if it is a very quick associator and a dissociator, you would obviously need a smaller time. And if you have a very slow association and dissociation, obviously the time needs to be increased. Uh, buffer requirements, the buffers that go in uh, should be 0.22 micron filter. They are of course available uh, to buy from GE, but it is not a big deal. I mean you can make it yourself as long as your chemicals that you are buying are of good quality and just pass them to through uh, 0.2 micron. Um, do make sure you have P20 uh, which is a detergent uh, in the and it is a non-ionic detergent because you do not want any ionic detergent running over the surface that can spoil your things. Um, it is important to have a detergent to remove the stickiness because the proteins are quite sticky and they stick to your flow cell and you know for the maintenance of your system it is uh, you know important also. Uh, in some cases where you do not see binding you might want to remove the P20 and do your experiments and see if it is working but make sure after that you go run through a good you know maintenance cycle. Okay. What is P20? P20 is a detergent, it is a non-ionic uh, detergent. 
uh, sorry, I don't have the full uh, name. So once you have your uh, immobilization ready, you uh, pass your sample exactly that the experiment that you did today in the lab. You know, you did a zero concentration, you did a low concentration, and you did a high concentration. You need to test the surface exactly that way because the first thing is you don't want to uh, use huge amount of analyte, which is which could be very expensive for you to get it actually to set up so much of run, and then you realize your lab you know, ligand was not proper or your surface was not right, right? So you test the surface once uh, before you set up a big kind of experiment. So you uh, run two different concentrations, low and a high. First, you get to see the shape of the curve, which gives you a lot of information like we discussed. You know, the shape of the curve you get to know and you get to see that exactly what you were expecting, you have got that. Uh, the other thing is you see a dose dependency right, that a low concentration, higher concentration, you see a dose dependency. Uh, the third point is you have also calculated your R max and based on that you have had immobilized your ligand and with that are you getting your R max, are you getting your, um, uh, are you or not. So these are very, very important things to keep in mind when you are setting up your assays because if you don't, if something is actually not falling in place, it's, it's time to check right there rather than, you know, setting up the whole thing and uh, going, okay. So that was all about the sample injection, uh, you know. So the last one is uh, your regeneration, right? After your um, association, dissociation, before you go to the second cycle, you actually find out the regeneration, which is stripping, uh, removing all your analyte from the bound ligand, okay? I think you saw this, it's just removing uh, all your bound analyte from the ligand. So there's a way to check whether your regeneration conditions are fine or not, okay? So, the, so if you may have taken, um, say, 50 millimolar glycine pH 2.5, right? And you have done a regeneration and you see, so you run the first cycle, you get your curve, right? And you do a regeneration with your desired regeneration condition. Then you run exactly the same cycle again, the second time. If your regeneration cycle is good, then you are supposed to get the same response unit because you are using the same concentration of analyte, okay? If you do not, if it goes down, then it is not optimal. But at this point, you do not know whether it is, with this one cycle, you do not know whether it is, it was harsh or it was mild, right? You just know that it was not optimal, your regeneration was not fine. So you need to do a couple more things actually. So before that, let's look at some of the regeneration buffers that we supply. But again, these are very generic buffers. You can have them yourself. You, the regenerations can be low pH, ranging from pH 3.5 to 1.5. It can be salt, uh, sodium, uh, sodium chloride. Um, it can be detergents, uh, ethylene glycol, okay? So various things, uh, typically similar things that you use in downstream processing also. So some guidance to find out whether it was the regeneration, uh, you know, how to find out the ideal co uh, condition. And there is again a scouting uh, wizard that, uh, that you can use to check, you know, which is your ideal pH condition, right? So what you do is a minimum run five cycles of your, um, you know, use the same analyte concentration, the same pH and you run uh, five cycles of it, okay? So what you're seeing out here is the analyte binding response and at the same time you need to see your baseline, okay? How your baseline is, if you do not, if your baseline is increasing, that is some, definitely something is stuck on the surface, right? If your baseline is either stable or going down, that means it is too harsh, right? So let's look at this uh, situation where is, this one is 5.5, .5, so you have run five cycles with it's 3, 2.5, 2 and 1.5, okay? 3, 2.5, 2 and 1.5. So these are the reg regenerations that done and you're looking at an, an analyte binding here and the baseline response here. If you say at uh, 3, what is happening? The analyte binding is dropping, okay? And your baseline is increasing. It's a clear case of uh, what? It's clear, it's too mild, right? Because your baseline is increasing. It is truly, it is definitely, it's very mild. You're not 
removing all your ligand. As a result, your baseline is increasing, right? And this is dropping because your ligand is not available to bind in the next cycle, okay? And when you go to 2.5, you see a slight difference. Here there is a slight increase and then here there is a slight decrease. This is probably slightly not explainable because, you know, in earlier, because it was run just after this. So, some spillover from 3, pH 3 is still there. So, not yet, you do not know the conditions yet. But if you look at pH 2, both are stable, kind of like a actually ideal place where you are keeping both your analyte binding as well as your baseline perfect, right. So, meaning that you are stripping out everything and each after each regeneration you are binding the same amount. But if you look at 1.5, your baseline is stable, but your binding is dropping, right. So, when it is too harsh, not necessarily it is going to strip out your ligand. So, your baseline typically remains stable, but your binding goes down. So, that is your harsh condition. So, this is again a very um, good way to find out your, uh, you know, regeneration condition. I think that is, you know, the end of the talk. So, we talked about some, you know, ideas to, you know, how do you do your immobilization, what are the things that you need to take care before you run your samples, your regeneration conditions. I think it will give you a good start when you start with your beer core assays. Thank you. If you have any more questions, I am happy to answer. Yes, sir. This is Pia. We are on the assay with live cells. Yeah. So, in live cells, and uh, we have a uh, lot of analyzed single analyte. Mm -hmm. So, we can do uh, to uh, run more than one analyte. Yes, you can do it, but in separate runs, right? So, if uh, because of uh, uh, in Indian tradition, mm -hmm. uh, we have used like uh, hundred medicines. Right. In that case, uh, one one analyze one run, one molecule will uh, act on some times. Mm -hmm. But in case uh, uh, in another way, if uh, you have more molecules, the combination of all together. Yes, absolutely you can do those. Uh, so, there are uh, ways that you can do, um, you know, multiple, whether, you know, one binding is affecting the other binding, those kind of studies can definitely be done, absolutely. So, you have to do one after another. So, once you have your ligand, you uh, either mix two, solu two things and then see the binding, what is your response unit and then do the bindings in single analytes and then check what is the binding, if the binding has increased with mixing. These kind of things can also be done. Choosing between the different methods for which we can measure uh, KD, for example, mm -hmm. uh, would you please suggest when one would prefer to choose this PR? Um, so, what what other methods do you use for KD? Uh, either the uh, cell based method or the uh, any lab method, or maybe ELISA you can also use to find out the KD, right? So, uh, you know, finding out the KD is not the uh, crux out here. The KD is the affinity value. There are other techniques to find out the affinity value. What you and based on the KD or based on the affinity value, if you are actually rating your molecules, you might be limited in the knowledge that you have. Because uh, two molecules can have the same KD, but they might have different association and dissociation constants. Because KD is actually the ratio between uh, the association and the dissociation constant. So, y you would choose SPR when you are actually wanting to look at the detail of how the molecule is really behaving, you know, whether it is a fast associator or a uh, slow dissociator or things like that. So, that is the key here. Yes, yes. Uh, so, you know, in typically when you look at the papers that is published, you typically do it at room temperature. So, whenever you report a KD value, you mention the temperature at room temperature 25 degrees, 22 degrees, things like that. Okay, now if you are, say for example, you do not see a binding at a temperature, room temperature, uh, you might lower it a little bit, you know, 10 degrees, 12 degrees, 15 degrees or, you know, to, to check 
whether it is still binding or not. In that cases, you can actually do it. A lot of people want to uh, find out their KD values at 37, thinking that it is more close to the physiological pH to look at it. In that case, also you can choose a different temperature. And you said that uh, the fetal system is inbuilt. Uh, yeah. Degassing causes sort of cooling, chilling. Oh, no, so the degassing um, actually removes all the suspended bubbles or air which is inside the uh, liquid. And uh, you know, if you don't remove them, they tend to create uh, spikes in the response, you know, and, and you do not get a very neat. Uh, the process itself causes temperature to drop down. It does. It does. I am. Probably a little, but I don't, but it still maintains, uh, uh, well, I don't think so because your, your, your samples are kept at a particular temperature, right? Your analysis is happening at a particular temperature which you are actually setting. So, I mean, if, even if you are, if you claim that, you know, it, it changes the temperature, then it is still set at the temperature where, where you are setting and, you know, you get the, at least the binding at that. Yeah. Um, in terms of association and dissociation, is it usually off determine the affinity because chaos is diffusion control and under such conformational change in binding, then the chaos is different. Well, K on and K off are the property of the interactants. You don't change them typically unless you are changing the temperature they don't change okay so you can only you know increase the temperature to increase your association okay the rate of association you push it a little higher okay but it, it is it is the property of the interactants so you know you don't change them by anything if I'm sure by now you are familiar with the SPR based experimental workflows. You are also pretty confident about the very basic processes involved in doing these experiments till the data processing and data analysis. You also understand that if you are not very clear about experimental design and if you are not very clear about data interpretation, you may end up with lot of false positives and artifacts. In label free biosensors, one of the major concerns have been how to ensure that a binding which is seen is it coming from two biomolecules or is it non specific binding? Is there bulk effect just coming from the buffer itself or some other artifacts which are present on the these gold chips? And that is where your understanding of these experiments and nitty gritties where Dr. Oma talked to you today becomes very crucial to distinguish, delineate that what is the right binding and the data obtained from that the sensorogram versus what could be an artifact which comes from the bulk effect. Some of these concepts will be taken further again. Thank you.